Hello there, uh, I'm Neil Mortensen, I'm chair of the charity Octopus, Oxford Colon Cancer Trust. We raise money for research, education, training uh, and raising awareness of colorectal cancer, Crohn's disease and colitis. I'm here today in the Royal College of Surgeons in London. I've previously been the president here until recently, I was president for three years and prior to that I've been a busy colorectal surgeon in Oxford. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Chris Van Tulliken. So let's get to bowel cancer and see how um, ultra processed foods and what we eat might have an effect on how we get bowel cancer. So just a few facts, uh, around 45,000 new cases of colorectal cancer every year. Um, it's the fourth most common cancer after breast, lung and prostate. Uh, and most people who get bowel cancer are over the age of 50. In fact, the majority are around 70. But I guess what's been most concerning over the last year or two is the increasing evidence that we have a number, now double, nearly treble a number of um, younger patients, under 50, young onset colorectal cancer, and there doesn't seem to be any explanation for it. And it's clearly very, very worrying. And we both of us see in our experience with friends and relatives, and certainly me and patients, it's uh, really noticeable that we are beginning to hear about, see, uh, and, uh, and, and know patients who are under 50. And, and maybe there's something in the world that's doing it, and maybe it's food. It, so I, I'm fascinated to hear you say this because I have noticed now that among my friends, I'm 46, but over the last 10, five years, I can name five or six friends who have uh, got metastatic solid malignancy. That some, of them, some of them have, have had uh, colorectal cancer. One has died of colorectal cancer. And, but when it's a small group of people, you don't know if this is just an anomaly. So it's really interesting for me to hear that the, the epidemiological data that says that this is a real phenomenon is also playing out in your practice. You are actually seeing more of these patients. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a bit shocking because many of these patients, of course, present late because the story has always been bowel cancer is something you get in your 60s or 70s. And when somebody has bowel cancer symptoms, you know, in, in their 40s, they think, well, it can't be that because it's a disease of old age. I've had a feeling that it's very plausible when we look at the, the, the mechanisms. You know, my background is as a molecular biologist. Um, but from, from your perspective, one of the things that seem very striking to me is lots of the things that I think of as being risk factors for cancers, particularly bowel cancers, have been in some respects improving. We've now known about fiber, fruit and vegetables for a long time. I would have guessed without having the data that colorectal cancers in under 50s would be not worsening over the last 20 years. And that's not what we're seeing. So tell us a little bit about food and lifestyle and how they might have, have an effect. So it's worth explaining what ultra processed food is. It is not an informal term, okay? It is not like junk food or fast food. It is a well-defined uh, category of food and it forms part of the Nova Group classification. And we now, uh, 15 years later, have more evidence around a dietary pattern of ultra processed food, which we have in this country. So 60% of our calories on average in the UK come from ultra processed food. Uh, we have more evidence around this dietary pattern than around any other dietary pattern that we've ever studied. We have more evidence than we do about the, the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet or, or, or any other kind of diet. And, um, and the evidence is around the dietary pattern. So ultra processed food, the definition is nine paragraphs long. It's really, really unwieldy if you're a scientist, but it boils down to stuff wrapped in plastic made with ingredients that you don't usually find in a domestic kitchen. And it's a way of describing the kind of products that are they're convenient, they're marketed, they have intellectual property, they're branded. So it's some of its obvious junk. It's oh, if you go into a fast, big fast food chain, that will almost all be ultra processed. But it's also all of our breakfast cereals. It's all of our supermarket bread. It's most of our flavored yogurts. It's almost any product with a health claim. So if you're eating a nutrition bar for lunch or lots of our busy colleagues will have these um, meal supplement drinks, you know, that you can, you can drink your whole meal without leaving the operating room, for example. So that's all ultra processed. And the definition wasn't created 
to regulate the food, the definition was created to ask this very simple question, does industrial processing affect health outcomes? And so we've used the definition now in randomized control trials, in big population studies, and then for, for basic scientific research. So can I ask, it could be what's in the packet, as it were, particularly the additives, or it could be the packaging itself, because we, you know, we, we hear about microplastics and all that kind of stuff. So it might be some of that too. So there are, if you like, the additives to the plastics, the bisphenols, the phthalates, that cause endocrine disruption and inflammation and probably microbiota disturbance, disturbances in the microbiome. But then we also are increasingly worried about the small particles of plastic that come from the plastic packaging, that come from our plastic water bottles, that may come from the plastic pipes, pipes in the street. Again, we're consuming particles of plastic that are going into the gut, interacting with the microbiome, probably being absorbed. Certainly the nanoplastics are being absorbed. And we know then in, in lab experiments, those microplastic particles are inflammatory. And I think inflammation has become a really big part of the cancer story in the last 20 years, in a way that it probably wasn't actually when I was at medical school. Yeah, chronic low-grade inflammation as a promoter, absolutely. But maybe we could talk about what's actually happening inside the colon. Um, tell me a, bit, a little bit about your understanding of the microbiome inside the colon. <laughs> so I'm an infection scientist, so I, I spend my life clinically destroying the microbiome in patients. You know, I give them antibiotics and we, we disrupt it. If I go back to basics, you have hundreds of millions um, at least, uh, sorry, hundred, hundreds of billions of bacteria lining probably quite a lot of the gut, but particularly the large bowel, the colon. Um, it's the largest immune organ in the body, and it's, it's all at once sort of part of you and not part of you. So it's, it's, um, it's essential for life. And I think of the, the, the bacteria in the colon as a sort of metabolic engine. They can digest food that we can't, so they extract probably around 10% of our calories from the fiber. We, we can't digest fiber. We can only digest the, the protein and the fat and the sugar in our diet. The very specific way in which the bugs in our gut eat our fiber and the exact amounts of these molecules they secrete, the timing and the location they secrete them at are all, all seem to be very, very uh, exquisitely balanced by the gut. And there's a dialogue between this these bugs and our immune system that I think we're just beginning to unpick. What we do know is that if we disrupt the microbiome, mainly with poor diet, by changing the balance of the bugs there, some of those bugs start to secrete harmful molecules, and we think some of those may be carcinogenic. They start to interfere with... One or two bugs have been identified, haven't they? Right, They're so in the literature suggesting this is secreting something which is directly affecting... Um, DNA the, repair, yeah, all that stuff, um, yeah. and and so they start to really interfere with the the things that we, at least, are adjacent to the things that we think also drive cancer: the ability of cells to repair DNA and divide. Um, Lifestyle is really really interesting because I think of the mechanisms as it, there are sort of two types. There's the direct carcinogenic, I guess, effect of the food whether it's the additives, the poor nutrient profile, the lack of fiber, the migrant molecules from the plastics, the microplastics, there's, there's all of that. But then there's also the fact that the food is obesogenic. This is food engineered so that it's hard to stop consuming. We have very, very good evidence about that. It has all the properties of food that we, we've understood for decades does this. And, and that's its purpose, is for you to buy it and eat it. And obesity itself is inflammatory, and we know that obesity is a risk factor for cancer. So it's it's like you're getting this double jeopardy of food that's making you gain weight and that being a risk factor for lots of cancers, including bowel cancer. But also the food itself is, is disrupting the microbiome and harming the cells. So if we want to ask, how, is it plausible that ultra-processed food or foods like ultra-processed food might be linked to colon cancer? It seems to me just off the top of our heads, and this is still quite an early research field, you and I have come up with a lot of mechanisms that feel very legitimate. They're not, they're not wild theories. Is, is, is that fair from your perspective? Yeah, I think it is. And I mean, coming back to the mucus uh, uh, idea, of course, the colon isn't just a flat surface. It's got lots of little pits. 
uh, and it's down at the bottom of these pits that what are called the stem cells, the cells that make the lining are continually doing their division and replication and then sometimes accumulating errors. And if that mucus is stripped away, then the bad, bad things can get down into the pits and get to those stem cells. So again, here's another possible mechanism by which the bad things we eat and the bad things that are in the colon soup can actually begin to affect the process of cell division and the formation of these adenomas and these cancers in the colon. So um, we've been talking earlier about this cohort of younger patients getting colorectal cancer. Uh, all the evidence suggests these are the people born in the 80s and, and 90s and onwards. So was the is the, is the beginning of the peak instance of the effect of ultra processed foods from about then on? Does that kind of tie up? If you look at US data, in the mid 1970s, men and women, black, white, Hispanic groups, all ages, everyone starts gaining weight at the same time, and we know this coincides with the introduction of mass industrial food processing into the US diet. Microwaves have been invented. Everyone's got a home freezer. Now, we lagged behind the US by five to 10 years in terms of it, it's fundamentally American food. It started coming over here. So by it's our ultra processed food consumption starts really taking off early to mid 1980s. So I think that that fits really well with yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. So my, I am a, I was born in the late 70s and my childhood was pretty ultra processed breakfast cereals, snack bars. A lot of it's still around today. But we, my, in my childhood, we were still eating three meals a day, quite often of ultra processed food. Now we're eating five or six times a day. So it's the, it's the spaces between meals that have been taken over. So we call this the snackification of the diet. Okay. So ultra processed food consumption, first it took over our meals, then it took over our snack times. And, and now of course we can order it late at night. We can eat it before we go to bed first thing in the morning. You can eat it at any time of day. Okay. So uh, what we wanted to emphasize, because it's Bowel Cancer Awareness Month, is that if you're under 50 and you have any bowel cancer symptoms, um, you've got to get uh, checked out. So over the age of 50, there is now the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. You can have a poo test. A little piece of poo is tested for microscopic amounts of blood in it, a special immuno test, which is pretty accurate. And then if it's positive, don't worry because the next thing is you get a colonoscopy. And I go ask you, Chris, have you ever had a colonoscopy? No. I, I have, I've had two. I, I just want to say to everybody, it's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, the prep's pretty bad because the bowel has to be cleaned out. But actually the colonoscopy itself is you maybe have some sedation, maybe you don't, and you can watch on a TV screen and look to see if you've got these bumps and so on. My brother's had one and he, we've, I've seen the video of his colon. Yeah. It was very instructive. Yeah. So I'm 46. Yep. When should I start sending off my, my poop? Well, you can't in the national scheme until you're 50. Right. But, so, so I might do that but if, 50. but if tomorrow you suddenly say, I've noticed some blood, or, do you know, I used to be very regular, and now I'm going a bit all over the place. I've got some episodes of diarrhea, and it's not because I've eaten anything. Bit of tummy ache. Or if you were suddenly found to be anemic, any of those things should really raise alarms and you should get checked out. I think part of the problem is in the medical community, even if you went to see your GP, and this isn't for a moment knocking GPs at all, but they are used to seeing people in their 70s with yeah. colon cancer. If somebody comes along in their 40s or 30s with these symptoms, I think, well, it can't possibly be bowel cancer. Be what we're, what, yeah, what we're saying now, it definitely can be. And you must, you must, you must be checked out. Yep. Great. Okay. And if, if, if bowel cancer is found, of course, um, it is very, very curable. Uh, if it's caught early, 90% uh, five-year survival rate, that's the way in which we describe how well people do, one of, the best colon, one of the best cancers to have. And of course, minimally invasive surgery, keyhole surgery, robotic surgery, some very, very good new drugs coming along. Um, and so the outlook is being transformed. So it's not that you shouldn't get checked in case you find you've got it and oh my God, it's going to be terrible. It's you must get checked because the earlier we find it, the better the outcome. If you find it when it's still a bump or a little polyp and it hasn't spread, you can cure yeah, me. Those are, well. those are all snipped off at the time of the colonoscopy. Uh, and then obviously they're looked at under the microscope. Um, 
we need to get to the point where we bring all these things together, Chris. What do you think about changing behavior? Is it too late to change behavior? I mean, there'll be 20-year-olds maybe watching this or 30-year-olds. Should they change their behavior if we do begin to see more and more evidence that ultra-processed food and colon cancer are related? I've been very careful. I, I, I think it's true in the last two, three years where I've been quite public about ultra-processed food, I've never, ever told anyone to stop eating it. And the reason for that is because the food we eat isn't really for most people a choice. It's the food that's around us. It's, it's what our culture eats. It's what we can afford. It's what's yeah. available. Yeah. It's quite easy for uh, people with resources to switch away from ultra-processed food, but it is fantastically expensive. So we know that people in the bottom 25% of households by income it would be essentially impossible for them, for most of them to do it. They would have to spend almost all their income on food to eat just according to our guidelines. And it's worth saying ultra-processed food is not the only harmful food. So uh, if you live on a diet of, you know, traditional cheese, red meat, um, you know, butter uh, and, and low fiber, you could not eat much ultra-processed food, but you would still be pretty unhealthy. Yeah. So it's, it's not the only unhealthy food, but almost all ultra-processed food is unhealthy, including the stuff that claims to be healthy. Okay, so you heard it here. Um, I'd like to extend a, a big thank you to Chris again for coming and joining us. Big thank you to the College of Surgeons for letting us shoot this here. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. I've certainly learned a lot, and Chris, it's been great to chat to you again. Thank you. <laughs>